Okay, I'm ready. Good afternoon. So, not as much talking on my part today. I just want to capture some basic ideas that I've already mentioned that are applicable to our reading of the three short stories by Charles Loomis. And in general, this is something that you have to keep in mind as a core idea, as a set of guidelines to read and interpret films or uh, books, novels, or short stories about the automobile from this class, right? And after this, I'll, I'll use the blackboard to write down a few ideas. I <clears throat> want to do an activity with you about the automobile, and then, as usual, we'll watch scenes from a movie, and today's movie is Bumblebee from the Transformer series. So, just this. You're about to read, or you've just read, uh, the first set of readings, fiction about the automobile, the three short stories by Brooklyn Knight, Charles Loomis, and what's the point of this kind of reading, right? What's going to be on the exam, professor? It's not about the details that you find in those stories or about the stories of the characters per se. When we are reading, we are trying to identify common patterns. This is a cultural studies class, right? So we're trying to study the representation of the technology of the automobile as well as models that are common in popular culture across a variety of technologies or a variety of topics altogether. So when you take a modern narrative, because uh, of course we only have modern narratives about the automobile or media, the, the first silent films and then the uh, films with sound about the automobile, including the love bag that we watched to, for the last two weeks, and Bumblebee that we're watching today and next Thursday. What are the things to keep in mind? And as it is done commonly, right, you know about stories having a beginning, a middle, and an end, and movies usually follow a three-part uh, structure. I'll identify three parts in here as well that you can find more prominently featured or just quickly done in fiction and films. But this is how we simplify the readings and how we find what to focus on in those readings so that we're not distracted by the details. So the first act we'll call anticipation, and then I'll explain what this is about and how it can be played out in a narrative. The second act we'll call immersion. And the third act we'll call transformation. So anticipation is before the technology. Immersion is the first or the most significant experience of the technology by a user, a, an owner. And transformation is the conclusion opening up to the future, taking stock of what changes have been caused by the technology and whether those changes have been disruptive in the life of a character, in the life of a community, etc. And therefore, whether the technology will be embraced together with its positive and negative changes, or whether the technology has brought some kind of individual, spiritual sometimes, transformation in the life of the characters. And this schema covers, as I said, a lot of films, a lot of fiction about the automobile. Anticipation can take different forms. Of course, there might be hopes or fears 
based on rumors about the technology, based on the observation of others using the technology, and sometimes, depending on the kind of fiction, especially in films, especially in science fiction literature, a common trope would be signs, meaning I don't understand fully what I'm about to experience. I don't know what this introduction of the technology will bring. However, I see clues. I find signs, meaning things that I can read and translate into emotions or into attempts to rationalize what I'm about to experience with the new technology. A common pattern that usually starts in here and then prolongs itself into the second act, we can call the seduction. It doesn't have to happen every time, it could start at the beginning, it could start later, it could happen or not during the immersion, meaning we can call it the fall in love with the technology, right? The idea that the more I'm exposed to the technology and the more I find things that capture my attention, my imagination, provoke positive changes in my emotional world as a user. As I said, this could be placed within the first act or across the first and the second or could happen entirely in the second. By immersion, we can have different forms. The most neutral way to define immersion is exposure to the technology. And I'm using exposure rather than use because depending on the narrative, the character may experience the technology whether they want it or not. We'll see a typical example of this in Jules Verne's Master of the World, where a federal agent who has been sent by the American government to stop a madman scientist who's using his invention to terrorize the world, is captured, taken aboard this vessel, which is uh, something magical that can go on a road like an automobile with wheels, can go in the air with wings, wings that are flapped to keep it moving and keep it afloat, can go on water like a boat, can go underwater like a submarine. So once the federal agent is captured and taken on board this vessel, he'll have to spend days while the captain of the vessel, the scientist, the madman himself, goes around North America. And this is the exposure, right? He's not has not been his choice. He was there to arrest the madman. He gets captured and taken on board. But through prolonged exposure, he will experience also the seduction, right? Created by the immense power of this vehicle, which can go in the sky, on the earth, on the sea, under the sea, right? And so many possibilities open up uh, in terms of what can be done with this. And the government itself, of course, is interested in this kind of technology. When the immersion in the technology is not passive. Exposure has a passive quality to it. But when it's not passive, there is still a, a similar kind of experience that we can define as rapture. Meaning that the experience, the emotional impact of the new technology is such, is so disruptive, so big, that I'm completely taken by it. And it's not completely passive compared to exposure. It, it's really the full realization of seduction, right? So I enter into this relationship with the technology fully, 
it's not just me, it's not just my decision, it's also the power of the technology, the seductive powers of the technology that I feel on it. Of course, depending on the narrative, the immersion phase, especially, to put it towards the end of it, may turn into a reflection, right? So at some point, right, before we turn to the conclusion, at some point, the characters start to think about their experience, right? So they've been exposed to the technology or they're being completely obsessed with it, completely taken, overwhelmed by it, but at some point, they're able to step back quickly and take this and really think about this experience, trying to recover their control and decide what they're going to do with it. In the example of the story that I mentioned before, the science fiction book from 1905, uh, the federal agent on board this incredible vessel, after experiencing the powers of the technology, the seduction, will have a reflection that will lead to a dilemma for him. That is to say, do I stay on board? Do I join this group, this madman who's also a great leader, a charismatic leader, or do I continue acting like, or go back to acting like a federal agent, and therefore he will at the very end decide that he's going to destroy, to sabotage the machine, causing it its destruction, because that is at least a partial fulfillment of its own, of its mission, right? In in light of its governmental duty, stop this guy, arrest this guy, stop this technology from uh, creating anxiety and fears in society, interfering with commerce, commercial traffic, uh, with traffic on the road, etc. Okay, so this is of course a possibility, and transformation in its purest form, it's the choice between adoption of the technology, meaning I didn't have the technology, I came to know about it, then I had a real experience, a close experience of it, and now the technology is going to stay and become part of my life, right? And Rejection is the opposite alternative, which was interestingly common in the literature about the automobile from this period. And we cannot imagine anything like that happening nowadays. Imagine a magazine printing a story where users buy an automobile and at the end they say, oh, I don't want this in my life. It's terrible when the magazine is posting ads on automobile. And already 1900, 1901, 1903, during this period you have ads of automobiles and automobile parts in those magazines, but they, they're not really using the strategic side of marketing, pressuring magazines, I'll withdraw my support, you will not have my ads if you publish these stories these days. Of course, it would happen right away. Rejection, however, is still present, especially in films. As I mentioned, think of 007 and how film after film, almost every time, at the end of a 007 James Bond movies, the headquarters, the hidden secret base of the evil guy or the evil organization that James Bond is fighting is destroyed. Either self-destruction, right? Those scenes where pieces are falling while our heroes, James Bond and a female counterpart or other friends are trying to get out. And you find that in the parodies, Austin Powers, for example. Or somebody from the outside, planes are coming to drop bombs in no time to die. Missiles are coming to destroy this, right? And it's a play on the theme of the rejection, right? Let's stop this madness by destroying both the perpetrators, those using the technology, and also the technology itself. 
However, the same way that you have a reflect may have a reflection in this section, you may find something similar in here, right? Uh, at the end of big movies, you may find a moment where the the core of the story and what we've learned from the story comes out, and this is usually in the form of some consideration of the theme of disruption. That is to say, whether I've embraced the technology or whether the technology is not unavailable because it's been destroyed, what was the disruptive power of this technology? That is to say, if I've adopted it, what changes have occurred and will continue to occur in my life now that I've adopted this technology? Meaning, my life will not be the same. So there is an arc of transformation. If it was rejected, then practically in every modern narrative, it's never, there is never a closure, right? Because in modern literature, science fiction especially, in modern films, you also, you always want to have, to keep the door open for a sequel, right? If, if things go well, you want the next book to be purchased by your readers, your faithful readers. So even, if, even when the technology is, is destroyed, there is this sense that things will not, will not go back to normal, that you'll never get back to before the technology, how things uh, were the tr same tranquility, the same routines, because you know that the cat is out of the bag, that this technology was destroyed, but who knows whether they have copies, they have other uh, products stashed somewhere because the madman is killed but you don't see him bleeding to death or being uh, uh, his body exploding and therefore maybe he died because the entire thing the entire building collapsed because he disappeared under the water but maybe he didn't maybe he'll come back right and evil guys come back in all sorts of ways in modern literature, from Moriarty in the Sherlock Holmes series to the, the various evil guys of the, the present, including Dr. Evil, right? Um, so keep this in mind. Again, it's not a matrix that you can apply exactly on every fiction, every movie, but most of it works on most fiction most kinds of fiction, whether it be written, literature, or films. Three acts. First act, and of course, when you have three acts, it doesn't mean the first act could be five minutes in a film, in another film could be 35 minutes, right? But you have anticipation, the setting up of the situation before the beginning of the story. You have to stop, establish the baseline for the characters in order to then follow their arc into some kind of transformation. So anticipation, which can come with hopes or fears, or just signs, ominous signs that something is about to happen. And between the first and the second act, you have the development of the seduction of the technology, right? And I put seduction, but if you want to include moralistic stories, stories where there is a moralistic judgment of what the technology is about, seduction could be defined as temptation, right? As I mentioned before, the federal agent on board the fantastic machines that goes everywhere, sky, earth, sea, etc., is tempted to join the crew to become one of the officers of or, or collaborators of the leader so that he can fully experience the powers of this technology. Second act, immersion, which could be more passive, just exposure, more participative, the rapture, and towards the end there may be some reflection opening up some kind of dilemma, what will happen in the conclusion, because it, it, it's not working and because you have to separate the acts, right? You have to create a sense of loss, sense of change. 
And the final act, the realization of the transformation, how things have changed compared to the beginning, adoption of the technology, rejection of the technology, taking stock of what changes the technology may have produced. Okay, so as I said, I want to try an activity with you which can be the starting point for a discussion because while you're working, I can circulate and help you or respond to your questions and at the end, we can share some of your findings. So take one of these and proceed. However, if you want to use your computer, then you can place your reflections inside your Google Doc. Okay? That would be fine as well. My suggestion would be do this in a small group. No more than three people. But if you want to do this activity individually, I'm fine as well. Okay? However comfortable you are. And of course, uh, as far as Working in a group, feel free to move around. In case you have a computer and you want to consult your computer or from your phone, you want to go to the class wiki, the foundation for this activity are the, is, is the core concepts presentation. And the very first section where I explain what a technology is, what is a simple definition of a technology, and what a modern individual or personal technology is about. So I'll rehash the main aspects of a modern technology, and then your task will be to apply this matrix to the automobile and develop it as you see fit based on your readings or just your experience, your reflection. So we said, the first thing is that, to keep in mind is that a defini the definition of an individual personal technology of, of modern culture is that it is personal, not simply because you have one user of the technology, meaning it's not a train. A train is not a personal technology because, yes, you can get on board the train as a person, but you're not controlling the technology, right? You're just being taken from point A to point B. You're participating in this technology which requires an infrastructure, a crew on board the train, etc. Individual technology such as the automobile, the bicycle, the phone, is one that can be operated by one person, right? And also, personal, we said, because it's collaborating, participating in the construction of your public persona. So it's not just a utilitarian technology, but it's something that has an impact on yourself in some way and the way you're either presenting yourself or the way the others perceive your identity, your personality, etc. So it can be used as an extension of your public uh, persona. Okay? But this is the foundation, the elements that you have to analyze and provide examples for are the following. Following the same list that you find in the class wiki. There is a utilitarian function or multiple functions, but in here I'm talking about primary functions, right? So, yeah, I can find a cigarette lighter in the car, and that's utilitarian because I use it to light my cigarette. I don't smoke, but if I did... That's utilitarian, but not so relevant for this section because it's not the primary utilitarian function of the car, right? Uh, it's just an accessory. Besides the utilitarian function, you have what I called 
superfluous function or functions. <clears throat> and again, they may not be the primary, but they're almost primary functions, meaning strong things. Okay? What does it mean? It means that a modern technology often is used by the users. Maybe it was not designed that way initially, but then it gets to be used to do things that don't serve a purpose, but users find pleasant to do, interesting, exciting, okay? So the basic example, but it's up to you to find more, for this would be the Italian function of the car, transportation, right? Going to work going to the doctor, etc. But the superfluous faction, the classical example would be cruising. Taking the car just to go around without a destination. Go around to think. Or go around just to be seen. Cruising the main street of a village. Again, not necessarily something that is very popular now. And you have to reflect your own experience, right? But during the 20th century, cruising, going around the main street of a village or town in the U.S. with your car as a young person was a very common function. And there are films such as American Graffitis built around that. Then going from concrete to abstract, you have the immaterial features or qualities. For example, I pick a car not because it takes me efficiently from point A to point B, but I pick a certain car because it's different, it's unique, because it makes me stand out. Nobody or almost nobody has that car uh, or um, it conveys in my mind as a consumer an idea of elegance and therefore people will see that I'm elegant, will see that I have a particular taste in all things, including cars, right? This would be an example of immaterial features and qualities. So in the wiki, I developed this matrix in reference to the phone, right? What I said, primary function of the phone is to communicate with others. Secondary, to consult uh, stuff on the internet, and then of course this, this gets switched. The superfluous and immaterial functions for the, co for the phone are many. Well, the phone can be used to withdraw from communication. I have the phone, don't disturb me. They can be used to communicate with people around the same table, in the same room. I will not use my voice. I will not get up and come to you. I will text you, right? This would be superfluous because it's redundant, right? I already have that skill, that ability. I, I don't need to have it doubled by the phone, but in fact, this is happening, right? Calling people to the table for lunch using the phone instead of saying, it's ready and material features, function, qualities would be uh, how the phone can become an accessory, right? You can bling the phone, you can bedazzle your phone, you can pick a phone so that people will see that you're one of the very few having this, this particular phone. The most common example these days would be an expensive folding, foldable phone. Okay, so in groups of three at the most, or individually, try to develop this with some points, some examples in reference to the automobile. You can do it on the page that I circulated. You can do it on the computer inside your Google Doc. If you're working in a group, I just need a piece of paper, one file, just add the names of the people who work with you, right? And when I review it for grading, I will assign the same grade to everyone, okay? So, what's the time right now? 2.35.
I can give you 15 minutes at the most. Would be ideal if you can do it in 10 so that we can exchange some idea or, or leave time for the introduction of the film. We can practically skip utilitarian functions, right? Most of you, I gather, wrote about transportation. Any other ideas about utilitarian functions of the car? Yes. The car radio. Car radio? Yeah, as like a... And as a primary function, it's interesting, it's relevant, it's very relevant, but justify, argue, rather me that it's a primary function, meaning that the car was designed primarily for radio, unless it's a police car or a military vehicle. Well, I was thinking like when it was uh, first being used as like a way to receive news, or um, I mean, not really you know, talking or whatever, but pretty much just to receive news while you're Yeah, you receive news about the traffic once in a while. Before people had cell phones, you could tune in. You can probably still do it in Europe for sure. In Italy, there is a frequency 103.3 that you can find everywhere. There is a highway nearby, just broadcasted news about traffic. Right. So I was thinking that that was the utilitarian part of it, superfluous. But it's 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 borderline. It's yeah. not exactly primary. If you want to push the primary, you could say special vehicles, ambulance, primary to time function to take someone to the hospital in time, right? Military vehicle to transport troops during a military operation. So that is primary, that is being designed into the vehicle. And there are all kinds, right? Fire, uh, fireman vehicles, right? There are all kinds of specialized utility vehicle, construction vehicles, etc. But I don't know, other than transportation or special vehicles, I don't know what other utilitarian functions can be classified as primary, meaning that the car was designed to execute them. Let's get into the interesting part. So it's up to you, we don't have to go in order. You can mention superfluous or immaterial features. Again, superfluous means that it's something I could be doing in a thousand other ways, but I elect to use the car or the car took over uh, what existed in terms before in terms of practices. For example, I was mentioning as superfluous function, parents using a car to put their baby to sleep, right? Going out in the middle of the night, there is no other way this baby can fall asleep, but I know that if I drive around the block, the baby will be asleep in five minutes, and a lot of parents have done it, right? The car was not designed for that, and certainly there are many other ways, and the doctors would recommend other ways, but it can be used for that. And in reference to immaterial qualities and features, the best example that I can offer, but then I want to hear yours, would be to have one of those big fancy Jeeps, a uh, Jeep Wrangler with 22 inch wheels, even though it's impeccable, polished, waxed, and that Jeep has never and will never go in the woods on a hill, on a steep hill, or across a, a brook. So why did I buy it? Because I want to be seen as a nature, outdoorsy kind of guy, and because it's different, etc. What ideas can you offer about superfluous or immaterial? And specify which is which. Yes? Yeah, it's not a symbol, right? Yeah, and I was yeah. thinking, like, a Rolls Royce that specifically comes with, like, custom umbrellas, and, that, like, you know, for uh, people who own it, kind of kind of show, like, I'm a big Regal's brand, what? I paid for this, so I get this extra luxury that serves, like, no function to the car, actually, but just, like, kind of... Yeah, to the point where you can find people renting an expensive car from Turo or from regular companies just to be seen, just to take pictures to post. Right, to enhance their public image. Anyone else? Yes. Just playing your car at a car show would be superfluous. Yeah. In, in a way, yeah. Showing your pride of ownership. 
and how you make your card is in terms of artisanal craft. Yeah. Or else, other ideas. So just a couple of things so that you can understand the story. This is the story of a high school uh, young woman and a sentient robot coming from outer space and how they help each other. This would be the simplest way to describe the story. What's interesting about the film is that you find the two main characters, Charlie, the American girl, and B-127, who will be nicknamed Bumblebee by Charlie after they meet. And they are both lost at the beginning of the story. They're both trying to rebuild their future and to change, to go through a transformation. And they help each other achieve that. What's happened to Charlie? Charlie is going to high school and there she's not part of any popular student circle, right? She, she's the opposite. So very frustrated socially in her school. Yes, she has a friend or two. In fact, she even has a friend who would like to be more than a friend, but uh, it, it, she's, she's not seen that angle and not really finding it interesting to rely on, on this guy. In her family, something happened. Uh, before the beginning of the film, possibly a few years back, when she was about a teenager, Charlie lost her father. Her mother remarried, and she finds herself the same way she's isolated. She feels isolated and lonely at school or in social circles with his friends. She feels isolated in the family because her mother and her new husband are very close to each other. They're good, but the, the stepfather is also a bit too much to, to handle. A good guy, but it's not what Charlie needs. It's not the kind of father figure that his own father was. And then she has a brother, and the brother is perfectly one with the couple, with the uh, mother and, and the stepfather, because he's a kid. And so he was able to go through the tragedy and uh, just rely on the support of his parents. With her father, Charlie was working on restoring a Corvette from the early 1960s, one of the initial models, beautiful. Of course, the work on the car got interrupted when her father died, and she has tried, we'll see her trying, to fix the car by herself, but she's not succeeding. However, we know now, I introduced that idea, right, that in these fields, working on the car means working on the self. Those two things are aligned. She's not able to fix the car because she's not able to fix her own personal situation by herself. And no one in her family, her mother, father, stepfather, and brother can do that for her. Then we have B-127. He was, before the film, living on a planet with other Autobots, sentient droids that can transform into vehicles that they see. They can target a vehicle and then reprogram their components, their shell, to mimic the shape of that vehicle. But their natural status is to be a robot with legs, hands, with weapons. On that planet, they have terrible, harsh enemies called the Decepticons, who are evil transporter uh, robots. There is a war, the good guys, the good robots, the good bots are losing, and Optimus Prime, the leader of the good bots, tells B-127, who's just an apprentice, who, who's just growing up 
as, as a bot, not a warrior. He says, you live, because of course the warriors have to try and save the planet, go find another place where we can hide if we lose the war. So B-127 gets to Earth, but there things go, don't go well for him because he's not so fit, not so skillful. And therefore he finds a, a group of soldiers led by John Cena, the actor who's trying to destroy and capture the bot. He finds an enemy, a, a Decepticon chasing him. At the very beginning, when you see this, is the end of the scene where B-127, which is yellow and therefore will be dubbed Bumblebee, has been hit and has to try and save itself by camouflaging as another vehicle. So his voice box destroyed. He cannot talk as he would normally do. And a lot of his components are destroyed, so he's trying to find things he can transform to, into. A Wanabego, no, it's too uh, difficult. Finally, he finds a Beetle, Volkswagen Beetle, that's simple enough. He changes into the Volkswagen Beetle, but his batteries die, and therefore he's condemned to remain this Volkswagen Beetle. That's how Charlie will find it in a junkyard. She will buy, she will work on the Beetle, purchase the Beetle, well, actually the owner of the junkyard will give it to her, and this will be the beginning of her building up her future. Then she'll find out at the end of the sequence of today that Bumblebee is alive. They will establish a relationship between equals and they will train each other. They will help each other. She will help him become a warrior. He will help her become a person that people can look up to, a full mature woman. By the end of the film, the last scene, the epilogue, we see her on this beautiful restore Corvette. Finally, she was able to restore the Corvette. And she looks like a woman. She looks like someone who's powerful. And at the end of the film, they'll separate. Bumblebee will scan the horizon there on above the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco. She will see a Camaro. She will turn into a yellow Camaro. And of course, Charlie will say, what? You could have been that? I could have been riding a Camaro instead of a Volkswagen Beetle, but that's the final joke. So, we will lose sight of Bumblebee, who's crashing, transforming into a, the, the, the car and then staying that way, and move on to the scene, one of the various scenes in which she wakes up. Every morning at the beginning, she's depressed. She doesn't want to go to school. She doesn't like her face in the... Uh, in, in the mirror, she, she has acne, everything goes, her family is annoying, they're good but they're annoying, her stepfather is, is almost cringy, but then day after day we see her transformation, especially after she starts working on the car and then after she finds out the car is a sentient android robot.